In 2019, a classic attraction returned to King's Island. Hello, everyone. Alongside Ryan Sir, I'm Don Helbig, and this is Tower Topics. Tower Topics is a podcast by King's Island fans for King's Island fans, because that's who we are, and that's who we care about. So, Ryan, 2019, uh, the big new attraction was the King's Mills Antique Autos, bringing back a popular ride that had been there from the park's opening in 1972 to 2004. When you heard the news that antique cars were coming back, what were your thoughts? Um, I was concerned uh, because the old antique cars were so well done with bridges and water features and stuff like that. And uh, I, I, cause I remember hearing about, I was hearing the rumor and it, I, I had heard that they were going to get a flat ride for quite a while. And then I heard, antique cars like in the days leading up to it and i in my head i was thinking like if they just put antique cars on like a flat plot of land like that's going to be such a disrespect to the previous version um and obviously that wasn't the case the new antique cars that came are just beautiful and um you know water features and bridges and so it's smaller than the other one that we had back up until backlot stunt coaster was built but it's still like it's a fitting it's a fitting tribute yeah, I mean, it's not the ride, you know, experience the ride time on it. I mean, it's not significantly shorter than what the other one had been. Now, the other one had two different sides to it, which made it look a lot bigger, right? You know, than it really was. But uh, that was a situation where, you know, the park, the general manager, Mike Koontz, you know, really listened to what the guests had been asking for. Mm-hmm. Guests have been asking for the return of the Flying Eagles. Yeah, uh, those were, uh, you know, immensely popular. They were moved to Carowinds, and he had asked multiple times to get that ride back. Always told no. Uh, yeah. But the next ride on the list was, you know, the anti cars, mm-hmm. and he was able to get that. And I thought, you know, the space where it is, uh, something was needed there. You didn't have uh, the flight commander pad wasn't in use. Uh, Dinosaurs Alive was gone, not yeah. coming back. Uh, there needed to be something in that area to, uh, to, you know, both dress it up, but also to bring some traffic down that way. And, you know, I, I thought they hit a home run with this. I mean, just beautifully landscaped, uh, nice course. You've got the, um, you know, the different billboards and that, you know, a lot of different Easter eggs, you know, beautifully done by our good friend, Paul Bonifield, you know, yeah. works out of the uh, Cedar Fair planning and design, but just, just really well done. And in a lot of ways, uh, there's, there's some parts of it that are better than the original. I, I could see an argument for that. I think that the theme is certainly better than the original and, you know, shout out to Paul uh, Cedar Fair's professional troll. Uh, who does things like this. Uh, and I say that out of a spot, uh, a place of love for Paul. But um, yeah, I think that it kind of like, it conveys like a, a really cool, like a village. And then, you know, if you're watching the video version, we're coming across Kramer's Crossing, which is the covered bridge, which is a tribute to Doug Kramer, who was, uh, was a director of fire and safety. Was that his title when he retired? Yeah. Yeah. Director of fire and safety. Uh, he was somebody that started working at the park in 1972 seasonally worked his way up just a great guy. And, uh, you know, I was thrilled uh, when they honored him by, you know, naming that bridge after him. Yeah. I was really happy about that too. And, you know, if, if you had to choose between the cars, I definitely like the old arrow ones better, like full disclosure, but these ones made by gold, are so they're so good looking. They're really, really good. They're very good looking. Yeah. The other ones have a little bit more, you know, a little more spacious, you know, a little more comfortable getting in and out of, but no, these look beautiful. And it just, you know, even when you're up in the Eiffel tower and you look down in Coney mall and you see the, the, uh, uh, antique autos and just how, you know, well landscaped it is. And you've got the water features and that, uh, it just looks just beautiful. And it's a great looking night ride too. I agree. Now, I always thought that they needed to do something more with it for Winterfest. Like, uh, they did the 12 Days of Christmas on the train, which I think is kind of a... I didn't actually ride the train last Winterfest, come to think of it, but um, I always thought the 12 Days of Christmas was underutilizing the train with how associated trains are with Christmas. But putting the 12 Days of Christmas on this, I think, would have been really, really cool. Like, I mean, what do you think of that? Obviously, like, you don't know if there's discussion around that, but... 
Um, I think that would be neat. Yeah, there's some, uh, you know, definitely has opportunity, you know, for the Winterfest event to do some different things with this. Uh, you know, one of the great things about the antique car rides, you know, whether it's at Kings Island or, you know, other Cedarford parks or in other parks, you know, across the country is for a lot of guests, that's their first ever time behind a wheel. Yes. Of a vehicle. And mm -hmm. it's memorable. You know, so you talk about different rides in the industry and one of the ones that conjures up the, those those memories that last a lifetime and people talk about forever are the rides on the antique cars. Yes. You know, so for that purpose, you know, just how it creates those memories and how families, you know, something that they can do together. And for the young kids, what a big deal it is, you know, when they get to drive. And I remember my daughter with the original, um, you know. Uh, antique ride at Kings Island, how, how big of a deal that was for her and, and how exciting it was for me, you know, to, to have her drive. And I, just to have that back, you know, what was something that I was excited about when I knew that, you know, this was coming back to Kings Island. Uh, the announcement in, in 2018 was done in the Fest House. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of, you know, just the speculation, you know, every you know, son of beast is coming back, whatever, you know, there was all kinds of things off the, you know, out there. It, it, speculation was running wild. Uh, but when, when the general manager, Mike Koontz, you know, came out from behind the wall, driving that antique car, just the reaction in the fest house, uh, you know, and all my years working there and doing the different, uh, you know, press events. And even as a guest attending different press events, um, just how excited everybody was. I mean, that was right there, you know, with announcing Diamondback and Banshee and, and some of those other other rides, like King Cobra, you know, just different things that I was around, Vortex. So, uh, you know, just that level of excitement, you know, was something that guests of all ages, you know, could do, uh, family, friends, something they could all do together. Uh, you know, it, it's just a great attraction, and it's so good to see that it's back at Kings Island. So when when they uh, originally discussed it, do you know of any other ideas for theming or anything like that that may not have made the cut? Or is it kind of in line with? In line with what they were talking about, you know, and the planning and design team, you know, we talked about Paul Bonifield. Uh, you know, this was a great opportunity for them to showcase their talents. Mm -hmm. And I thought the name, you know, it fit, you know, Kings Mills, you know, nod to uh, you know, the neighborhood where Kings Island is at, um, right. you know, the antique auto is a nod to the original antique car ride, uh, you know, perfect uh, attraction for, for Coney mall, you know, it really, really fits that area of the park. Um, uh, it just looks beautiful when you're walking down the Coney mall midway and, you know, and you see it as you're going toward, you know, shake around and roll from the racer end, or if you're coming from the other way, you know, from Rivertown and you, you know, you see the station, and again, especially at night, how it's all lit up. Um, you know, now it looks like it's been there forever. Mm -hmm. and I thought the original uh, anti cars that you know was stunning. You know, with the white picket fence around it. Yes. Uh, you go up in the Eiffel Tower. I mean, that was the best. You know, the, the, it just really, you know, fit perfectly in that area. And I was not happy when they removed it. And the Flying Eagles to make room for uh, Backlot Stunt Coaster. Great ride, Backlot Stunt Coaster. But what it replaced, it just, you know, was just kind of a disconnect. Never really fit that part of the park. Um, so I would have left it as it was if it was my call, you know, back in the day. Um, but if you're going to replace it in something that was as iconic as the original, I mean, this this one hits the spot, checks all the boxes. Yeah. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is uh, I, you, I, I think you and I would both be both humbled and surprised by the amount of people that uh, probably had never saw the anti cars uh, who listen to this podcast. And I'm pretty sure that this is an image of it. And this is from... Uh, yeah, we're 20 years now since that's been removed. So, you know, there's, there's, yeah. uh, you know, if you're any younger than, you know, say 25 or 26, you probably don't really remember it. 
Yeah, so I think this is right. Um, it, this is an article yeah. about bringing back in 2019, but it, I think that's Kings Islands. It's uh, but you can just see how sprawling. Now, if, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember this, but I've been told this. So they had uh, the antique cars on one side, lace taxis is over yeah, kind of where yeah. backlot is now. Did they yeah. not connect the two courses together? So they were they were like almost like identical type of layouts almost. But yeah, they were, were two different. Yeah, yeah, just two different sides where you could you could board. Um, I thought they connected and, and, them, it, and that's why it felt so long. But it, it might just, have felt long. No, so no, it just it, they just closed down the other the other side, you know, after several years. And uh, but yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, you know just one of my favorite attractions growing up. Yeah, and I can remember you know being at Coney Island and the Turnpike cars the first time I could drive that and just how exciting mm -hmm. that was. So uh, the antique cars were a bigger version of the Turnpike cars. So when I, I you know get the Kings Island uh, you know 1972, I'm driving that big big deal, and I couldn't wait uh, to to let my daughter get behind the wheel. She couldn't wait either <laughs> to drive it. And, you know, I remember her coming home, telling my wife how excited she was. And guess what? I got to drive the antique cars. And uh, so just having those kind of memories, you know, this is an important ride. You know, it's not the biggest, longest, fastest, anything like that. But in terms of creating memories, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, one of the best rides at Kings Island for me. How do they not have antique cars, which are gas powered, run out of gas all the time in the middle of the track? <laughs> oh, no. How that happens. I, I'm, I'm guessing they have some sort of rigid routine where they refill them with gas. Yeah. Because uh, they probably know they last like, I don't know, four hours or whatever. And they just take them out of service at three and refill them. But I've always wondered because they essentially run off lawnmower engines, if I'm not mistaken. And they you, they definitely yeah, very like similar to that. Yeah. And uh, so you, you slam on the gas and you, like the whole thing shakes just like a lawnmower, like a ride. Yeah. When it first starts out, right. Yeah. So I've, I've always wondered what would happen. I guess they would. It's probably not as complicated of a procedure as you'd think. I, I bet in a worst case scenario, they just take another anti car and push it to the end so they can yeah. fill it up with gas because uh, they have bumpers on it. They got bumpers with springs on them. I mean, they're ready to be wrecked into each other, not in the manner that Dodgems are, but um, but yeah, I've always kind of wondered about that. But I, I think the, you know, the 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 Kings Mills Antique Autos is such a wonderful tribute to the original anti uh, antique cars. Uh, one thing I do want to bring back is uh, the antique cars used to be called the Teeks for short. All the cool kids would call them the Teeks. Yep. And I haven't really heard anybody refer to Kings Island, Kings Mills Antique Autos as the Teeks. And uh, I think we should take it back. We need to bring that name back. You're right. But fifth anniversary season. So mm -hmm. no better time than now to, to bring back the nickname, the Teeks. The Teeks. Yeah, let's make it happen. Oh, you know what? That's another T-shirt idea. Like, you know, because they had like Cincy shirts came up with like cruising along at five miles an hour. Right. Like we should get one that has a picture of an antique car on it. And to me, it, it'll always be the Teeks to me or the Teeks. And then on the back it says, I'm taking it back or something like that. So yeah. leave a comment if you would buy that shirt. And no, actually leave a comment if you wouldn't buy that shirt. We'll get more comments that way. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to the listener question. Uh, so this is from... Uh, Daniel Sadnick, he said, can you share any stories about the Kings Island Resort and Conference Center? And what would you do with that property if you had a say in the matter? I'll let you start, Don. Well, I mean, it, it opened with the park in 1972. Uh, you had two TV families that stayed there when they were doing filming at Kings Island with the Partridge family in 1972, the Brady Bunch in 1973. Uh, it had a pool, it had a restaurant, uh, state of the art you know, when it opened, but it was part of, um, you know, just a bigger complex of things to do at the time when Kings Island opened, they owned basically all of Kings Island drive. You know, mm -hmm. they had the golf center was under the ownership of Kings Island. Uh, they had the tennis, you know, was under the ownership of Kings Island. The uh, college football hall of fame, you know, was on that stretch of things to do. So it really was uh, a destination, made Kings Island a destination place you know, where you could uh, spend three or four days there and go to Kings Island, go to the Hall of Fame. Uh, if the tennis tournament was in town, you go see that, uh, you know, go to a Reds game, the zoo. So it was really that uh, made, you know, for that destination uh, that, you know, Coney Island, you know, wasn't when it first opened. 
um, but just really nice. Uh, I remember they had, you know, pretty good food at the restaurant. Uh, but then, you know, after it got sold off, you know, different ownership groups of it and that, uh, you know, wasn't well maintained. Uh, the name Kings Island on it, you know, wasn't good for Kings Island because it still was assumed that it was the Parks Hotel. And anytime there were some complaints about it, you know, the, the park would hear about it. Uh, so it's unfortunate what happened. I think if, you know, it was in, if it had been part of the uh, owner, or still being owned by Kings Island at the time that Cedar Fair bought it, I think you would have seen some renovations in that with it, and it would still be there today. Uh, so that was one of the misses of that. It, it just kind of missed the mark there of being able to, to be purchased by Cedar Fair with Kings Island. I think that was something that was missing. I think it's something that's still missing is having their own, you know, uh, resorts, you know, and it was a yeah. resort. I mean, it was it was really, really nice when it opened. Yeah. Um, and then the second part of the question is, what would you do with it? So I, 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 I guess you can either choose what would you do with it if it was still there, they hadn't torn it down or what would you do with the property if it was your choice? I, if it was still their property and hadn't been torn down, I would have renovated, you know, you look at what mm -hmm. they did up at Cedar point, you know, with some of the hotels there, you know, the renovations they've done to those. So I think that opportunity would have been there uh, to do that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Now, um, I want to share something on here. Uh, a friend of the show, Ronnie Salerno, actually got to uh, visit the Kings Island Inn as they were tearing it down. He was able to get connected. And um, I don't remember the name of the guy, but the general manager actually oversaw uh, the end of business there and still worked out of it as they were tearing it down. So I'm going to let me share here. Uh, and this is all from RonnieSalerno.com. And he had some fantastic photos uh, in his article is called Last Guest of the Kings Island Resort. And you can see here, not only is this a good archive of, uh, you know, what it looked like as it was abandoned, but this is, if you look, like this pool was in the Partridge Family episode, right? Yeah. But, and then the outdoor look, pool. The outdoor pool. Oh, the outdoor pool. Okay. I thought the indoor pool was, but uh, they had an indoor pool, obviously. Uh, and then, so if you look through here, you know, you can read the article with the whole story. He was told that the reason why they tore it down, and this is very common with hotels, is that they had a mold problem and it was, and to take care of it and change all the carpets and stuff was just something that the, they would never be able to pay off. No, it would so, have been, it would have been better just to tear it all down and, and rebuild it. Right. And then, so they tore it down and then they sold the land. And when they sold the land, it was going to be, like an apartment complex. And I guess the city of Mason pushed back on it. Um, so it's still standing vacant. Now, actually, I believe that Rivers Crossing Church right next to it bought the property. Uh, and I haven't heard anything about what they plan to do with it. Uh, if anything, for them, it could have just been an investment. But Ronnie took some great photos of the last days of the hotel while it was still standing. Um, you know, for those of you, you know, audio listening, uh, we're seeing a photo here of one of the abandoned hotel rooms with no furniture in it but there's three toilets in there so that's kind of ironic but i would encourage you to check out ronnieslerna.com uh fantastic information all across the board but this is a particular article that would probably be rather interesting to anyone that cares about you know the history of king's island and the king's island inn and stuff but uh it's very sad by the way um i imagine uh, if i get to answer this too if, if it was still standing and let's say it was viable to keep it open I would probably uh, theme it kind of like Breakers, um, you know, uh, not necessarily Breakers. The name has to do with like the lake and there's no lake, but they have those awesome carousel horses and stuff in the main lobby. I would do something like that. Paint a lot of it white like Breakers. Is. That looks really, it looks like classical modern almost. I would do something like that. But with that being said, the, the dynamic in there is Kings Island also, um, lost a big opportunity by selling the campground too and great wolf lodge stands there now um and from my understanding it was not a cash transaction uh great wolf lodge bought the campground property in exchange for a five percent stake in that particular lodge um and then uh, through a weird quirk of business when viacom sold sorry cbs sold the parks to cedar fair 
they did not sell that 5% stake. So that 5% stake remained with CBS. And then not long after, mm -hmm. Great Wolf, the company, bought the 5% back. So now Kings Island has zero stake in Great Wolf Lodge whatsoever. But, um, you know, there's Camp Cedar and stuff. But the problem with that uh, and the advantage that Great Wolf has is it's not connected to the park. So I see a big problem in associating the two. Yeah, we've got a campground, but you got to take a bus. We've got a hotel, yeah. but where it's across a busy road, you can't walk from there. You know, people did though when they had the hotel there. Uh, they had, did have a bus that would take you did, from yeah. the the. It was a double decker bus too. Yes. that would take you from the hotel uh, to Kings Island. Uh, but a lot of guests would just walk right across the street, and you know that that's what they did back in the day with it. I used to go there in the 1980s uh, during the off season. I would have lunch uh, once a month with Ruth Boss, who was the, the public relations manager there. And um, she would give me updates on, you know, things that was going to be new mm -hmm. that year, things that I would want to be aware of if I was doing media interviews to, to kind of slip in, you know, around <laughs> what I was doing with the racer. Uh, yeah, there's that double decker bus and that picture you're showing there. Had but, to find it. Had to find it. You did. You did. But uh, <laughs> yes, I would go there once a month, you know, for about a five or six year period, you know. So November, December, January, February, March before the park opened, you know, I was there uh, having lunch with Ruth and, you know, we would talk there. And it was almost my first foreleg into a, a marketing position. It was, they had a, a, like an entry level uh, position open. It was, you know, 1987, 88, something like that. Uh, and Ruth asked if I was interested in maybe looking into that at the time. Uh, she was trying to help me out there to get into the industry. And uh, I got transferred, you know, right around that time to Louisville, Kentucky. With a, uh, I was working for Brenda Moore Sporting Goods. So I got transferred to Louisville, Kentucky. So that kind of fell by the wayside. But um, yeah, just, you know, that's kind of my memories of it, is just having lunch there with Ruth. Yeah. So rest in spaghetti, never forgetty. Hopefully they build some sort something there that's of interest because I, I feel like, um, that with so many people that leave that area at 10 o'clock on the dot every night, a little bit after because there's fireworks, but there's got to be something. If there's something in the area that could be entertainment, but open till 12 or one, but it, it's in a manner that doesn't draw like the wrong crowd or right. whatever. I think like fun spot, fun spots function in, um, in, in Orlando. Like, I feel like if you get a fun spot during the day, you're the only one there. But as soon as Disney, Universal, and all them close at seven or eight o'clock, they're packed and they're open till midnight. You know, I, I would love to see a place. Well, we there. used to go over there. Um, you know, friends of mine from the American Coaster Enthusiasts when they were in town. Uh, mm -hmm. Friend of the show, Jess Novak. You know, uh, he would join me over there, and you know, some other uh, members of the club. But we would go over there after the fireworks, and we would have you know dinner there around ten thirty at night. You know, in, in the and the restaurant area, uh, the bar area that they had, you know, they had, you know, some really good chicken wings and a meatball sandwich. I remember that was really good. So uh, it was open till like you talk about that 12, you know, one in the morning. And that's, you know, a place that we would go for that uh, nightcap after the park closed. I would be down for something like that. Like, um, and, and it's funny because location, 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 if you look at it, like Wendy's probably spent a fortune getting rid of their old building and building that brand new one just so it's a better view from people heading north on uh, Kings Island Drive. That's the right. only reason. I'm sure it's a more modern facility, whatever. The reason why they did that is because they wanted that exposure and they're so busy because of it. And then you've got places like the, they had El Nepal where Viva Tequila was, which is still vacant. And all it is is like an eighth of a mile down the road. This is right across the street from Kings Island. And the way that Kings Island exits 50%, I would argue more than 50% of the crowd that leaves Kings Island is facing right for it. So if you want to put a hotel there, that would be smart. If you want to put an entertainment complex there, that would be smart. If you want to go a little bit cheaper and just put a nice restaurant that people can eat at until midnight, that would be smart too. But the fact that it's sitting there and it's still got the old Kings Island inn sign, but nothing's there but rubble, that's insane. Rubble and weeds. Rubble and weeds. All right. Okay. Great question. Thank you for submitting that. That... Uh, that's that was an interesting conversation. But hey, I'm Ryan Sir along with Don Helbig, and this is Tower Topics. <laughs>